All right, good evening, everybody. Tonight we'll be talking about the death of Christ. Uh, let me go back a little bit. I don't know why I feel so close. Okay. All right, today we'll be talking about the death of Christ. All right, so if uh, we'll pass these out. This one here for you, and then you can hand it over there to the others back there. <coughs> so we're going to be in our discipleship going through the doctrine of Christology. Christology is obviously studying the doctrine of Christ. It will be on the doctrine of Christ. So we're, in this particular topic, we'll be talking about the death of Christ. The death of Christ. So in the death of Jesus Christ, we do know that he bled and died for us because he loved us that much. And uh, you know what's really funny is that I pass those papers out to people, but I don't have it myself over here. So let me look at my bag. <laughs> So we've been going through some doctrines already in pneumatology, Christianology, and now we're going through some of the doctrines in Christology right now. Okay, so I don't know what happened to that piece of paper. I usually have enough, so I'm going to have to take, take it away from one of you. Sorry. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. So I will give this back to, I will give this back to you. All right. Let's go to Isaiah chapter... 53, please, Isaiah chapter 53. All right, are both cameras recording? Both? Yeah, both of them are good. All right, then. So we're going through our doctrine on pneumatology tonight. We're going to go through our doctrines on pneumatology. I mean, not pneumatology, Christology, excuse me. So Christology, pneumatology was last, last discipleship. And our doctrine of Christology will be talking about the death of Christ. The death of Christ. So, how did Jesus Christ die for our sins? What is the significant factors behind his death? And what did his death do for us? Not only that, we're going to also cover some of the criticisms against the doctrine of the death of Christ. So, the first place that we're going to be looking at is Isaiah chapter 53. Let's go, through his in, let's go through some of the intro right here, the intro. Now, as we cover the intro right here, first thing you want to understand is that it was prophesied in the Bible. So let me know if I'm out of line over here for both cameras. So, so it's prophesied in both cameras. I mean, not cameras, <laughs> prophesied. <laughs> it's, it's been prophesied in the Bible. <laughs> prophesied in both cameras. It's just so funny. All right, Isaiah chapter 53 is the number one best chapter that talks about the death of Jesus Christ. So this one's a basic that everyone should know. In Isaiah 53, we're only going to look at a few of them. Look at verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with the stripes we are healed. Uh, if you look at verses 1 through 12, I encourage you to read all of that in your spare time. It is a great chapter concerning the death of Christ. All right, the next one is going to be, we're not going to look at these verses, but other verses that was prophesied about the death of Christ is Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, and then Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. Now, if you look at these passages, you should use these passages to Jews. Because Judaism, they deny a suffering Messiah. So it would be best to actually look at these verses. Mm -hmm. uh, so Sean can't hear. He says it's almost silent. Although I could hear, he says it's silent. So uh, either I can move that phone up to where the uh, markers are, or we could put the audio technique on that one. Right? So if there's a little bit of feedback. That's OK. Problem solved right here. Yeah, we're going to move it right over here. Mm, I don't think over here might be a good idea, but we'll, we'll give it a try. All right, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can people hear me? All right, so let's make sure the other people can hear me through here, okay? All right, so let's continue on. So uh, it is also foreknown by God. God already knew that this would happen. First Peter chapter one. Turn over there. First Peter chapter one. And then we're going to look at verse 19. We're going to look at First Peter chapter one, and then verses 19 through 20. This was also foreknown by God, which is why He 
had a suffering Messiah set up. Ever since God created Adam and Eve, he knew that he would have to die for our sins. He loved us that much. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. So you'll notice right here, God already knew that a long time ago. You'll also see this at Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, as well as Isaiah chapter 53, verses 6 and verse 10. You'll notice that in these passages as well, that God foreknew that his son would die on the cross for our sins. Look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And then we're going to read verse 18. John chapter 10. And then we're going to read verse 18. Another thing right here is that it was voluntary. God was willing to die for us. He took the punishment in our place. Look at John chapter 10. And we will read verse 18. The word of God reads, No man taketh it from me. See that? No one forced this to happen. God did it himself. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Another thing is the 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It is purposed. It was purposed. The purpose of his death. So it wasn't like just by accident out of nowhere. The purpose of his death. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. In court, there must be a penalty. And sometimes they'll give the penalty as death concerning certain crimes. And you've got to understand that Jesus Christ, that's the reason why he died. It's because he had to take the death penalty for us. That's how much he loved and died for us. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we will read verse 10. The word of God reads right here, Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So notice right here that when Jesus Christ died, it's so that we can live. So he took our death penalty so that we don't have to die. 1 Thessalonians, uh, 1 Timothy, please, now. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And then we're going to read verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And then we're going to read verse 10. The result of his death. Let's talk about the result of his death. The result was that he came as the Savior to all the penalized. So Savior means person who saves. So he came to save people. What is it? From the penalty, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. That was the result. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. Why is that? Because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. See, he died so that he can become the Savior. All right, let's talk about the terms for his death. Terms for his death. Let's look at Romans chapter 5, please. Romans chapter 5, verse 11. Romans chapter 5 and verse 11. Let's talk about the terms of his death. The terms of his death is that it had to have one atonement. Atonement. Now we're going to look at all these doctrines that relate to his death as well as concerning the doctrine of salvation. These are all the terminologies that you should know, these terms. Okay, so these are very important that you're going to have to remember. Look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 11. So what does atonement mean? Payment made to bring two disputing parties together. It's a payment that is made to bring two disputing parties together. That's atonement. Romans chapter 5 verse 11 reads, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement. So notice right here that because of the atonement, in verse 11, we're able to uh, bring ourselves in front of God by the death of Jesus Christ. Look at 1 John chapter 2, please. 1 John chapter 2. And then we're going to look at verse 2. 1 John chapter 2. And we're going to read verse 2. The next part is his propitiation. 
propitiation. What is propitiation? What propitiation means is it's satisfying to the one you owed. It's satisfying to the one you owed. So what is owed? You must satisfy. 1 John 2.2, 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So notice right here that as a propitiation for our sins, it satisfies the payment to the one we owe. John chapter 10, please. We're going to look at John chapter 10 and verse 11. All right, so I'm going to move a little bit more to the side right here so that people can see the terms. We're going to look at John chapter, uh, what did I say, 10 verse 11. The next part is substitution. Substitution. So his death substituted in our place. We should have been the ones who died. So in substitution, what it means, taking the place of the condemned. It's taking the place of the one who is condemned. Notice what the Lord Jesus Christ said about his death. That's how much he loved us, folks. He took our place where we should have been condemned, where we should have died. The word of God reads in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. See that? So Jesus Christ trades his life, gives up his life for somebody else. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 18 as well as verse 19. 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 18, and we're also going to read verse 19. So what does redemption mean? So that's what you noticed right here, right? So what is redemption? Redemption is buying back someone with a price. So if you want to buy back somebody, you have to pay it with a price, and that's what the death of Jesus Christ did. It brought redemption. In other words, he bought us back with a price. So remember, Satan, he took us away from God because of sin, and in God, he stole us back from the devil by dying for our place. Now, that's a blessing. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed, with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Let's look at Romans chapter 5, verse 10. We're going to look at Romans chapter 5, and then we'll read verse 10. So the next part that we'll be looking at right here is reconciliation. Reconciliation. I love this one, reconciliation. Reconciliation is somewhat close to atonement. But reconciliation, what it means is that it's uniting what has been separated. It's uniting what has been separated. Let's look at Romans chapter 5, and then we'll read verse 10. For if when we were enemies, man, praise the Lord, you are an enemy of God, we were reconciled to God by what? The death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Man, that's a blessing. Look at Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. And then we're going to look at verse 28, Matthew chapter 20. We'll read verse 28. The last term you want to know right here is ransom. Ransom. That will be found in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28. Now, what does ransom mean? Ransom is simply means right here, price paid for the release of someone. Price paid for the release of someone. The verse says, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. So notice right here, all of these terms are connected to the death of Jesus Christ. If you don't know these terms, now you know. It's important that you mark them down. So if you have the papers, it's written down for you. For those of you who are watching online, uh, you're going to have to, if you weren't able to write it down, rewind the video and be able to write those terms. I think you can do that live streaming too. I think you should be able to rewind a bit. So if you guys miss out what I'm teaching right here, just rewind a bit and then you can find out. Or you can wait till we do our archive video. And then in our archive videos, you can catch up. All right, let's talk about the mode of his death. The mode of his death. In other words, how did Jesus Christ die for us? 
In what mode did he die? Because believe it or not, well, it's easy, Pastor. He died on the cross. Well, trust me, it's not that simple as you think. It is a debate among cults on the way that Jesus Christ died. Let's look at Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. So this should be obvious that even a Sunday school children should know. But believe it or not, there are cults who teach that Jesus Christ, he did not die by crucifixion. He died by a different mode. Let's look at Mark chapter 15 and verse 24. And then the verses that's going to be proved that will prove that he died by crucifixion is not only verse 24. You're going to have to look as well at verse 30 as well as verse 32. And then you're going to find out also at John chapter 20 and verse 25. And then you're also going to look at Matthew chapter 27 as well as verse 37. Matthew 27, 37. Now, why are we going to look at all those verses? To prove that he died by crucifixion. Because there's a cult called the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah Witnesses, they teach that Jesus Christ, he died on a stake. I don't know if some of you knew that. So he did not die on a cross. They claim that's a Roman Catholic teaching, yada, yada, yada. And they'll say that Jesus Christ, he actually died on a stake rather than on a cross. But look at Mark chapter 15, verse 24. And when they had what? Crucified him. See, it's by crucifixion. But let's continue reading. Verse 30. Save thyself and come down from the what? Cross. See, it's a cross. It's not a stake. Look at verse 32. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the, look at this, cross that we may see and believe in they that were crucified with him. It's by crucifixion. Look at John chapter 20. John chapter 20. But believe it or not, some of the Jehovah Witnesses in their Bibles, or at least some of it, it reads stake, not cross. They're correcting your King James Bible. They're correcting the word of God because they don't like the word cross. So they'll put stake in there. Look at John chapter 20. And then we'll read verse 25. Okay, let's assume that he died on a stake. So then if he died on a stake, then he died like this, right? On a stake. That's how the Jehovah Witnesses, they'll draw pictures of Jesus Christ in their Watchtower magazines. So then it should be one nail right here. But let's read verse 25. The other disciple therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the what? Nails. And put my finger into the print of the nails. How can more than one nail, he can hang like that on a stake? Unless he was crucified like this, and thus more than one nail. Thus this proves he died by crucifixion, not on a stake. Let's also look at Matthew 27, verse 37. Matthew chapter 27, and we will read verse 37. So I hope that uh, you'll keep tabs with the audio and the video online, because, uh, yeah. I, so try Matthew. To limit, try to limit the amount of talking you do when you're facing the board. Okay. Uh, That's when you're pretty low. Ah, uh, okay, I see. All right, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 27, and then we'll read verse 37. Oh, hey, uh, mm -hmm. the, the card thing. It still says record, but the little card thing's flashing. Uh, if it's recording, then it should be fine. Yeah, okay. it should be fine. Just look inside there. Is, a, is there a card in there? If there's a card in there, then it's working. All right, it's working. All right. Matthew chapter 27, verse 37. Set up over his head, his accusation written, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. So notice right here that above his head, they put uh, the sign. Now, if he's crucified on a stake, the sign should go what? Above his hands. Not above his head. So if the sign was right above his head, it shows that he, his hands had to be extended like this. So he was crucified undoubtedly on a cross. It was by crucifixion. We're also going to turn to uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Galatians 3 and verse 13. The death of Christ was a curse. It's a curse. It is not a blessing. It's a curse. Yeah. 
Well, it's a blessing to me, yeah, because someone had to take the curse for you. That's why it became a blessing. But you've got to realize the cross is a curse. If it was truly a blessing, Jesus Christ should have been blessed on the cross. You didn't hang on the cross, thus you're not cursed. See that? The reason why it's a blessing is because Jesus traded the cross with his holiness with eternal life. You didn't take the cross, you took eternal life. You took the blessing. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Thus, see, when you have cr crosses that are hanging around you, that's not a blessing, that's a curse. So that's the reason why, as Bible-believing Christians, we limit symbols of the cross. So I say limit because there are sometimes some cases you can't help it, but we, we don't uh, believe in crosses here. I don't wear a cross. So when you wear a cross around your neck, it's like you're fulfilling this verse. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Because remember, the cross is supposed to be a curse, sin, condemnation. You don't want that wrapping around your neck. You want the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to take it for you. <laughs> so that's the blessing with Jesus Christ crucifixion because of that act that he did for you and I not that you took it upon yourself or that you're wearing it or that you hang it around your church <laughs> all right we're going to look at mark chapter 15 and verse 15 mark chapter 15 and we will read verse 15 what we're going to be covering right here is the physical sufferings of his death the physical sufferings of his death so what kind of sufferings has he been through when Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. All right, so we're not going to look at these verses. I'm just going to be simply writing out the verses. I'll be writing out the verses for you so that you can take a look. On the physical sufferings of his death. So what kind of sufferings did he go through for us? So first, he was whipped. He was whipped. That is found at Mark 15, 15. Mark 15, 15. He was whipped for you and I. This should give you a greater appreciation of what Christ, how he died and bled for us. The second thing is that his head was crushed with a crown of thorns. His head was crushed with a crown of thorns. Mark chapter 15, verses 17 through 19. Mark 15, 17 through 19. How much suffering that he went through. He had to drink vinegar. Vinegar instead of water, he went through dehydration. When you're dehydrated, you want water, but instead, Jesus Christ drank vinegar and this is the creator of the universe who created all the sea this is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who said I am the water of life and yet he didn't get a drop to drink Wow what a Savior what love what love that the Father hath bestowed upon us through the death of his own son not only that, water gushed out of his side. So that shows he drained every last drop of his blood. That will be found at John chapter 19 and verse 34. John 19 and verse 34. This shows how much blood Jesus Christ shed for us. He didn't just bleed, folks. He bled so much that every last drop of his blood came out. Amen. That's how much he loved you and I. He didn't have to, folks. Okay, so as people might see on the camera right here, these are all the physical sufferings of Jesus Christ. These are all the details of what Jesus Christ went through for you and I. Now, before you say God is unfair to you and that things are really bad in your life, I, don't, I never saw that happen to you. I never saw that happen to you. I didn't see this happen to you, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. I didn't see those things happen to you. That will put anybody under conviction. All right? 
Before we whine and complain about our own sufferings, all you have to do is think about the suffering of your Savior. All right, we're going to look at not only the physical sufferings. Now, this is bad enough, folks, of the physical sufferings that your Savior went through. He also had to go through mental sufferings. You got to realize that it is quite a challenge. It is quite a suffering that Jesus Christ went through. So it's not just physically, also mentally. We're going to be looking at the mental sufferings that he had to go through for you and I. All right, so we're not going to turn to these verses either, but there's a lot of them. One, he died in the presence of sinners. Now, when you die, you want your loved ones, you want people that you care for to be close by you. But imagine people who committed wrong against you, people that you feel grieved and corrupted to be around. That's how you die. That's how you end up your life. <laughs> what a way to die mentally. That's traumatic. That's a bad experience. But Jesus Christ, he went that for you and I. That's found in Psalms chapter 22, verse 13 and verses 16 through 17. A second thing right here is that he was betrayed, abandoned, and denied by his close friends. So basically, his close friends hurt him. Now imagine that you had close friends, and then they didn't turn out to be so close after all when the going got tough. I mean, these were disciples who walked with him, who loved him, who said that they would die for him. And yet he was betrayed, he was abandoned, and he was also denied. Matthew chapter 26, verse 56 is another verse, as well as John chapter 18, verses 25 through 27. And then Mark chapter 14 and verse 10. The third mental agony that he had to go through, he suffered tremendous shame and embarrassment. He had to suffer tremendous shame and embarrassment. You might say, how so? Strip yourself naked in front of your school and see how embarrassed you are. Strip yourself naked in front of work. See how embarrassed you are. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6. Not only that, have people mock you, poke fun at you. You ever been bullied in school before? Some of you big boys won't admit that because you might say, no, I was a tough guy. Okay, well, let me say this then. This should put you even more under conviction. Jesus was the toughest of the tough. And he could have snapped them with his two little fingers. And he let them spit on his face. He let them mock him, poke fun at him. That's right. That'll put anyone under conviction right there. And uh, Matthew chapter 27 as well. And then verses 28 through 30. He went through tremendous shame and embarrassment for us. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 7. Isaiah 53, 7. Have you ever been a spectacle and a play in the school? You don't want to be that person, right? Jesus Christ was publicly for all the world to see. That's right. Another one is he was blasphemed. He was blasphemed. Now, God takes blasphemy seriously. How so? The punishment for blasphemy is to be stoned to death. So that's how God took blasphemy seriously. To him... Mentally, it was a very serious issue. And yet, such a serious issue to his mental well-being was damaged by people who blasphemed him as God Almighty. Luke 22, Luke 22, 65. He was forsaken by his father. That's got to be extremely traumatic. Because all of eternity, he never experienced separation from his father. So some of you who experienced separation from your parents before, I'm sure Jesus Christ understands the hurt. But let me tell you something. Jesus understands the hurt even more because he's been with his father for eternity. And he never experienced for the first time in his life what it was like to be forsaken by the father. He bore the sins of every man, and that's the worst mental trauma 
that Jesus Christ went through, bore the sins of every man. Adolf Hitler, he became very infamous for bearing the sins of his heavy crime throughout all of history. But let me tell you something, Jesus Christ had to bear the sins of Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, and especially you. And because of that, that kind of shame and that kind of feeling of hurt has done so much mental damage to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the mental agony that he had to go through for you and I. Now let's talk about the objections to the death of Christ. The objections to the death of Christ. What do you mean by that, preacher? Am I hearing that correctly? That's right. Believe it or not, <laughs> despite of this loving sacrifice Jesus Christ went through, you would think that people would not be stupid. People would have the audacity to actually object this. People will actually attack this. People will actually criticize it. Are you kidding me? After someone bled and died for you, loved you that much, how can there be an objection to that? That is extremely wicked, you must understand. So we're going to cover these so-called objections and see why they do not stand against the evidence and the test of Scripture. So we're going to look at the objections to the death of the cross and see how we can easily debunk these. So let's look at several cases right here. We're going to first look at Hebrews 9. So turn to Hebrews 9, 22. So now we're going to be looking at the verses. Go to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. 22. The first objection. Can man atone for his own sins? So that's the first objection. I can atone. I can pay for my own sins. I don't need somebody else to atone it for me. No, my friend, only the blood can atone sins, especially when we're talking about sinless blood right here. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. The word of God reads right here, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Blood has to be shed. You got to understand the one to whom you owe has the right to demand fair payment. That's why this objection will not work. Atone myself. Eh, wrong. Why? Because the one to whom you owe has the right to demand the fair payment. You don't have the right to demand what the payment is, what the terms of the payment are. You have no right yourself. Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16. It was an invention by Paul. <laughs> Paul the apostle made up this doctrine about the death of Jesus Christ paying for our sins. No, my friend, Jesus talked about it. Jesus talked about it. So what Muslims might argue that it, may, it was the Apostle Paul and Jesus Christ didn't really die. It was an invention. No, Jesus himself talked about it. So you need to know this. That way you can debunk some people who object to it, such as the Muslims. Jesus himself said it. Jesus himself said it. And in Islam, Jesus is considered to be a prophet to them. So let's look at Matthew chapter 16. And then we'll read verse 21. Jesus himself said, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. All right, I also wrote a second verse right here, which we won't turn to. Go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 2. Won't this make religious people feel hopeless and sin even more? So it's like a license to sin. So religious people, after all the hard work that they did, wow, you're saying that Jesus Christ, he did the payment on the cross, 
Thus, everything we do is for nothing, all these good works, so might as well just sin. We, might, we can sin and do whatever we want. There's no point to being good works, religious, etc. Nope, look at Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. See, it doesn't work that way. When Jesus Christ gave us grace through the death of, his, uh, through the death of the cross, he does not give you a license to sin. Look at Romans 6, 23. Romans 6, and then verse 23. Another objection to the death of Christ is couldn't God just blot out our sins without the crucifixion? So let's just say that God, he can just erase it. Erase the sins without the cross, without the necessity of Jesus Christ paying it for us. So if God is all powerful, he can just simply do that. No, the Bible says for the wages of sin is death. See, you gotta understand that Every crime against what is morally right and justice must be paid for. Everyone even knows that, otherwise we wouldn't even have a court of law. Every crime must be paid for. Now when you have a crime against a holy God, how heavy is the crime? See, that has to be fairly paid for. Look at Romans chapter three and verse 25, and then we'll close it right here. Romans chapter 3 and verse 25, and we'll close it right here. Another objection. If sin requires eternal suffering, then how could a few hours in Calvary count as enough suffering for sin? Hmm, that's a very good point. So the point is right here is that sin is eternal payment. Yet Jesus Christ, his death is just a few hours on the cross. Thus, this is a temporary payment, not eternal. So how can you say that the death of Jesus Christ pays for the sin when I can do that myself? Well, you're going to notice right here in Romans chapter 3 and verse 25 the answer. The matter is not the amount of suffering, but rather God's holiness and justice is satisfied. That's the issue. It's not the amount of suffering, but rather God's holiness and justice is satisfied. Because think about it. If you have, if it's a normal human being who sin, like everybody else, who is not like God Almighty, his payment for sin must be paid for eternally against an all-powerful, eternal, holy God. But let's say that the almighty, holy, sinless, the one who never sinned at all, a God like that was tortured, spat upon, beaten, shamed, and crucified with sins placed upon him, that's satisfactory enough. A sinner is one thing, but this we're talking about a pure holy God here. His payment is definitely far different. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So these are how you can answer to the objections to the death of Christ. So I hope that this doctrine has been very sobering to you on the physical agony, the mental agony that your Savior went through. Also gave you an idea of the basic terms you should know. You've heard preachers talk about that. Atonement, redemption, uh, reconciliation, etc. You just took it for granted, but you didn't know the true meaning behind it. So all of these happen through the death of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, you'll please bless the remainder of the hours that we're going to have. I pray that tonight's discipleship was a blessing to the hearers. Whatever is said and done will glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this 
is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.